Compared to the NBA and NFL draft, the MLB draft is small potatoes, the baby sibling. Younger than its two counterparts, the MLB draft has only been televised since 2007, and until last year, it was only available on the MLB Network, a channel that not as many people have. The MLB draft is also a lot more complicated. Unlike the other drafts, it's not as simple as draft the guy who you think is the best player. There's a complex bonus system going on that impacts the way every team goes about drafting. Some picks you can trade, some picks you can't. Some teams get extra picks for being in small markets, some teams don't. To the uninitiated, it's all a bit of a jumble. So here's a basic overview of how the MLB draft actually works. Why does the MLB draft even exist in the first place? Well, in the old days, scouts would just drive around the country and sign players wherever they found them. Backfields, sandlots, schoolyards, you name it. If a guy could play, a scout would take him. That's how Walter Johnson got discovered while working on a potato farm in Idaho. Then, the best and richest teams started stockpiling all the best talent and the whole thing got incredibly uneven. The league tried to limit bonus spending for a while to try and make everything more equitable, but that didn't work. So, in 1964, every single team, except the Cardinals, voted to implement a first-year player draft. After a bunch of changes over the years, that draft evolved into the version we have today. As recently as the 2019 season, the draft was a whopping 40 rounds long. But when MLB reduced the size of minor league baseball ahead of the 2021 season, that meant fewer teams, fewer roster spots, and fewer players that needed to be drafted. As a result, the draft was sliced in half, from 40 rounds to 20. Like most other drafts, teams pick in reverse order based upon their records the previous season. For instance, in the 2022 draft, the Orioles will pick first overall, the Diamondbacks going second, after Arizona hit a walk-off home run on the final day of the 2021 season, giving them their 52nd win of the year, tying them with Baltimore, and giving the Orioles the number one overall pick based on a multi-year tiebreaker. Tanking. It's more complicated than you think. Even though the draft is half the size it used to be, it still takes three days to complete the whole thing. Day one, which is on ESPN and MLB Network, includes the first round, the first batch of compensation picks, competitive balance round A, the second round, competitive balance round B, and the second batch of compensation picks. Day two is rounds three to 10. That's just on MLB Network. It moves much quicker than day one and has none of the pomp or circumstance. Day three is rounds 11 through 20, and that's essentially just a conference call, and that moves at like breakneck pace. But now that we've got the basic structure figured out, let's take a look at the most complicated part of the entire draft, the difference between comp picks and the comp round. For starters, the abbreviation comp stands for two different things in each of these phrases. Comp and comp picks stands for compensation, while the comp and comp round stands for competitive balance. Yes, this is incredibly stupid. Yes, this should be changed. And no, I can't do it myself. First, compensation picks. A team is awarded a compensation pick if they had a big ticket free agent leave over the previous winner. Depending on whether the team that lost a free agent is a big or a small market club, they either get a compensation pick right after the first round, or they get a pick just before the third round. In 2022, the Rockies and Reds will get those picks 31 and 32 for losing Trevor Story and Nick Castellanos respectively, while the Mets, Braves, Jays, Red Sox, and Astros get their compensation picks right before the third round for losing Noah Syndergaard, Freddie Freeman, Robbie Ray, Marcus Semien, Eduardo Rodriguez, and Carlos Correa. But remember, compensation picks are different than the competitive balance rounds. The comp rounds, comp round A and comp round B, exist in theory to help small market teams compete against clubs with enormous payroll capabilities. The exact teams that receive picks fluctuates from year to year, but generally it's your normal batch of tiny town teams. We're talking the Orioles, the Pirates, the Royals, Milwaukee, Tampa Bay. Weirdly enough, these picks can be traded and often are for back of the roster relievers or a bench bat in AAA. There's definitely some value to these, so they are dealt from time to time. Why is this order so kablooey? 
I don't know, but let's go through it one last time for clarity. First round, compensation picks for small market teams, competitive balance round A, second round, competitive balance round B, compensation picks for big market teams, third round, fourth round, on and on and on to 20. Got it? Great. In the NFL and NBA drafts, the consensus best player almost always goes number one overall. Teams usually will draft whichever player they think is the best available. Makes sense, yeah? Well, believe it or not, that's not always the case in the MLB draft. Players are rarely drafted exactly in talent order, with teams zagging early and often. Why? It's all about the bonus pool system. MLB instituted the slotted bonus pool system a few years back to try and artificially limit draft spending. This year, the Orioles' number one overall pick is worth just over $8.8 million in bonus pool space. The second pick is $8.1 million, the third is $7.5 million, and it goes all the way down from there to the very last pick of the 10th round, which the Giants have and is worth just $149,000 in bonus pool space. All of a team's pick values added up together is their total bonus pool, or in other words, the maximum amount of money they are allowed to spend on the entire draft. In theory, you can go over, but there are penalties that involve taxes on the overages, or if a team really goes over by a ton, the costing of future picks. For instance, the Orioles don't have to give their first overall pick $8.8 million. In theory, they could offer them just $7.2 million and use those $1.6 million in savings elsewhere in the draft. We'll talk a little bit more about that strategy later. It's really important to know that the differences in pool space between the teams is truly enormous. Picking early and often like the Orioles do this year means they have an absolutely massive $16.9 million bonus pool. The Giants, who finished last year with the best record in the league and have the last pick of the first round as a result, have only $5.7 million to spend. It's a huge difference. Last year, the Pirates had the first overall pick in the draft. They also had picks number 37, 64, and 72. In total, their entire bonus pool was $14,394,000. More than I have. With their first pick, they took Louisville catcher Henry Davis, who, even though he was very highly touted, probably a top five pick, was not considered the top guy available. As a result, Davis signed for $6.5 million, $1.9 million less than the recommended slot. By agreeing to the deal with Pittsburgh, Davis got more money than he would have otherwise, and in return, the Pirates got to save a little bit of catch to use later on, which they did. For picks 37, 64, and 72, the Buccos selected three super athletic, expensive, over-slot high school players, Anthony Solometto, a pitcher from New Jersey, Lonnie White Jr., an outfielder from Pennsylvania, and Bubba Chandler, a potential two-way dude from Georgia. High schoolers tend to have higher bonus demands because they have more leverage. They can go to college, whereas college players can't go to college again, although I'm sure many would if they could. All three of those players the Pirates took were considered tough signs before the draft, and all three got much more than the slot value from the Pirates to sign their contracts. The bonus pool money given to Solomedo, White Jr., and Chandler was only available because the Pirates saved money with Davis at number one overall. Now, obviously, the math here doesn't totally add up, but the Pirates saved money with a bunch of other picks throughout the draft to fill in the gaps between what they saved with Davis and what they paid Solomedo, White, and Chandler. For this year's draft, Drew Jones, the son of Andrew Jones, is the consensus best player available. If this was the NBA draft, he'd be almost a shoe in to go number one overall. But because the Orioles could save and spread like they've done in the past, there's a little bit of doubt about how they'll play it. It's an extra layer of strategy that might be a bit convoluted and complicated at first, but once you get the structure of it, it's pretty fun to follow along. All right, so who can actually get picked for this damn thing? There are a few different types of players. The first thing to know is that you have to be a resident of either the United States or Canada. Puerto Rico, DC, Guam, all the other US territories in the middle of the Pacific, that all counts too. The most common group of players taken are college juniors. If you attend a four-year school like UCLA or Vandy or LSU, any of those big power fives, you're eligible for the draft after the end of your third year. Or if you're a sophomore that turns 21 within 45 days of the draft, after the draft, 
you're also eligible. Confusing, weird, yes, but that's how this whole thing goes. That is what happened with Kevin Gossman and Andrew Benintendi. Both were drafted as sophomores. College seniors get picked too, but usually in the later rounds. They have less negotiating leverage because they can't go back to school for an additional year. Because of that, the best players typically sign after their junior season. Junior college players can get drafted whenever, after their first year at a JUCO or their second year. You don't see a lot of JUCO guys getting taken in the first round, but it does happen every few years. That's what Tim Anderson was. That leaves high school players. Those kids can get picked after completing their senior year of high school no matter their age at the time. That's usually what happens with like 99% of players. Bryce Harper and a kid in this year's draft named Cam Collier got their GEDs early after their sophomore year of high school, went to a junior college so that they could enter the draft ahead of schedule. It's pretty rare, but it is allowed. That's pretty much all you need to know about the draft. Again, it's complicated, it's complex, a lot of it doesn't make sense. We can make a hundred more videos about all the intricacies in the draft process, but we hope that you got the basics. We're gonna be doing draft preview videos here all week at the Cespedes Family Barbecue YouTube channel. We're gonna organize players into buckets, high school hitters, high school pitchers, college hitters, and college pitchers. We'll have a video out for each of those groups, ranking our top 10 players for this year's draft. Really hope you enjoyed the video. Like and subscribe, and then comment down below if you have any additional draft-related questions. We will do our best to answer them. Peace and love, everybody, and we'll talk to you later this week.